Okay, we're going to start with... Hello and welcome to our panel, Creative Renaissance, How to, Thrive, How to Thrive When It's Hard to Survive. Um, we are joined here by some very lovely people that have agreed to be on our panel today. I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves, um, talk about some of the work they've done with or for nonprofits, and just that will get us started. So, Joe, why don't we start with you? Uh, yeah, sure. So, uh, my name is Joe Barrett. Uh, I am a co founder and a current vice president of Creators Symbol. Uh, we are a new nonprofit that actually started this year. Um, basically, our, what we do is we find uh, discovered creators, uh, artists, writers, uh, and um, we actually go ahead and pair them up creatively with other creators. Uh, so uh, artists looking for a writer, we match them together as we can. Uh, also, what we provide is um, uh, hold and a footstep into actual professional uh, contacts and liaisons, so that way they can actually make those beginning steps into a professional career um, and give them that little bit of extra push. Um, also, we uh, are currently working with educators to come up with uh, curriculum plans that they can implement into their classrooms, so that way we can give them that extra hand at showing them that comics can actually this teaching and learning and that, you know, it can go a long way for them as well. All right, that's excellent. Why don't we jump down over to Kit? Uh, I am the programs manager of the Book Industry Charitable Foundation. Um, and we have uh, been providing emergency financial assistance to people who work in bookstores since 1996. And in the last couple of years, we have expanded to comic book retailers as well. Um, so uh, it is a great job to be able to give the money away um, that uh, fabulous organizations like um, C4C bring into us. Uh, so it's, uh, it's fantastic for us. Um, to reach out to, I'm, I'm going to stop. I think you're getting a bunch of feedback from me. You're okay. I uh, I think it's coming from my end. I'll just mute myself while you're all talking. You okay. Go. Sorry about that. Um, anyway, so um, I'm I'm thrilled to be here to so that even more comic book retailers can find out about us, and if they have a financial need they can reach out to us and uh, we can keep them financially healthy, working in their stores and keep the stores in the communities. That's excellent. Uh, Phil, why don't we jump over to you? Uh, hi, my name is Phil Jimenez and I've been writing and drawing comic books for going on 29 years, I think this year, uh, primarily for DC and Marvel Comics. Um, so I don't work for a nonprofit, clearly, but I have done a lot of work with nonprofits over the decades, um, usually by donating art and sometimes time. Uh, interestingly enough, the mo most recently uh, to Bink, B I N C, um, uh, I was one of the, the artists to donate some art and raise a chunk of money uh, to help beleaguered comic stores during COVID. And then Alonzo, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Alonzo Nunez. I'm the executive director of Little Fish Comic Book Studio. Uh, we're a San Diego based uh, nonprofit uh, comic book studio and advocacy group. Uh, so we teach classes uh, and run summer camps for uh, aspiring artists and writers uh, of the future. And then we do a lot of advocacy work for uh, the comic uh, medium as a whole, which means uh, we have a partnership with our local uh, National Monument, Carrillo National Monument, uh, KPBS through One Book One San Diego. We partner with them uh, to bring comics to um, to the classroom, to libraries, uh, basically uh, wherever uh, they can be um, of uh, educational value and also, um, you know, uh, pure entertainment. Very good. 
All right, and that kind of leads me into um, my next question. I always like to find out kind of people's stories, their histories, because that helps informs the conversation. So whoever wants to take this first, uh, what got you into working in nonprofits or with nonprofits or for nonprofits? Alonzo, why don't we start with you? Okay, yeah, I'll jump in. So um, uh, I, I started Little Fish um, eight years ago and uh, kind of tripped into being a nonprofit. Uh, very early on, we had um, a parent of one of our students uh, who is now our board's treasurer, and um, he was taking classes. And uh, she came in after one of the classes and said, uh, "This is really great. What you're doing, you should be a nonprofit." Uh, and I, uh, kind of faking it, right, uh, just said, that sounds really good, I'll look into that. And frantically uh, Googling a nonprofit on my phone and just what the hell that actually meant. Um, she was really instrumental in kind of uh, helping us along the way. Um, and I, I did realize as I started doing research that what Little Fish was aiming to do, um, to educate, to keep price points uh, as equi equitable as possible for uh, as many students as possible, uh, to uh, have a, a effective reach throughout San Diego. Um, the best way to do that was to be a nonprofit, to be able to partner with uh, other nonprofits, foundations, uh, and to um, you know uh, apply for grants. All right, and then uh, Kit, how about yourself? Um, I have uh, I've been involved in various. Uh, nonprofit social service groups in a volunteer basis for a long time. And uh, when, a, when a position came along with the Book Industry Charitable Foundation, um, I jumped at it because uh, you know I love helping people and I love books and you can put the two together and it's fabulous. And any, uh, and any chance I get that I get to travel around and, and visit bookstores and and uh, buy more books it's, uh, and give money away at the same time. It's win, win, win. It very much is. And then Phil, how about yourself? Uh, it's a harder question for me because as uh, I was mentioning to you earlier, I don't actually work for nonprofit, but I, over the decades, I've donated a lot of work and time to nonprofits um, with the interest, of course, being that these are organizations generally whose goal is to help people and generally help people who are underserved in some way um, and uh, through ventures that might not be considered by sort of larger organizations um, in ways that might be written off by uh, uh, folks who are on the ground per se. So most of my contributions to nonprofits have been through art, sometimes through public speaking, sometimes through um, teaching and assistive classes, etc. cetera. Uh, most folks want art so they can donate it to make money. Um, and invariably, you know, I have something lying around, which is which is great to contribute. One of the things that's been really interesting and uh, pretty spectacular to see in my business um, are some of its artistic leaders generating some really extraordinary work um, to raise money um, to help local comic book stores and others, um, uh, you know, through these organizations. Um, again, through. Uh, Bink. And so anyway, just um, that's my course through nonprofits. Uh, I'm actually really excited to hear Alonzo. Um, we, we go back a ways. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, I feel like I'm going to learn something tonight. Well, I hope we all are. That's why I love doing these panels. And then uh, Joe, how about yourself? Um, so um, we kind of my wife and I actually kind of came together on this, although it was me kind of just poking and prodding her the whole time and annoying her until she said yes, finally. Um, but a lot of the time it was, um, we would go to a lot of um, conventions and my wife is a, a librarian. And so she would speak at a lot of these conventions um, and give really solid information about um, developing your comics uh, space inside your library. And um, repeatedly, she was asked over and over again about, you know, how do I do this? How do I get in contact with these people? What can I do to help my collection here? Um, and it was all solid information. It was it was really helpful um, to the point where, you know, she she realized she was spending more of her time 
doing this rather than the actual, you know, kind of developing the library so much. I mean, the library was kind of handling itself day to day, more or less, but um, the development project was actually, you know, she could see change happening by actually talking to these people. And so I would continue to poke her as well and say, you know, you're really affecting change with these people here. You're actually um, helping them, you know, and, and this is, this may be your calling. It's, it's bigger than the library, so to speak, uh, what you're doing here. Um, so I would continue to, to nudge her along on, on that aspect of it. And then while I was at conventions, I would meet a lot of, um, a lot of artists, uh, a lot of uh, writers. Um, I'm, I'm a struggling writer, quote unquote, myself. So I kind of, you know, met these people through the same kind of in. I would talk to them and say, you know, how, how are you doing? How are you getting into all this stuff? And they would kind of give me the same stories about, well, you know, I, I'd love to do this, but, you know, I'm, I'm really struggling at kind of getting that, that entry level. And I don't know who to talk to. I don't know. You know, it's one thing you go to these talks, you know, at, at conventions and, and you hear, you know, the people on, on the panel say certain things and you're like, that strikes true with me. And I can, I can do that. But then they go home and then it's just, it's out the window f until next convention season one day ring true again. And all of a sudden it sparks again. And so it's like, how do we keep these people engaged? How do we keep them, you know, checking in consistently um, and seeing if we can't help them get to that next level of, okay, you went to the convention this week. What are you doing this week? You know, let's, let's continue going on. Let's keep it moving forward. Um, and so that was our two ideas kind of blended together, so to speak. And so we, we both just kind of decided at the beginning of the year, we were going to actually start this, um, this nonprofit and then I guess luck have it COVID um, because honestly it forced our hand of where we're no longer it's like you can put it off because you got work stuff you got kids stuff you got all this other things and it's like eh, we'll do it on the weekends and we'll build it from there and then COVID slams you in the house and you're stuck there for you know how many hours on end and so eventually you run out of watching you know reruns and you, you kind of decide, you know what, maybe we'll actually put a little more time and a little more effort into this and then a little more time and a little more effort. And, and then it just, and it kind of just built on itself. You know, we, we came up with a board within a, a month and it was just because we wow. shared our idea with people and everybody got excited. Everybody wanted to be part of it. And so all of a sudden we went from, you know, two, three of us, in a month's time to having we have 10 people on board that are regularly doing stuff for us um, and it's a small group but it was all just founded by the idea of we just want to do something for everybody else and and that's kind of the the basis of it yeah and you know what that wouldn't surprise me if there's a lot of nonprofits that have gotten their start that way i mean minus the COVID 19 part but <laughs> this inspiration of you know, we want to help people because it's something we're passionate about and we enjoy. And that kind of leads me into my next thought and question. We've got people from nonprofits. We've got people that have donated artwork and work to nonprofits for COVID-19. And I'm kind of curious. I know this is probably a question that can be answered pretty simply, but just how have you worked with either comics creators or as a comics creator to help people during COVID-19, the creators, the comic shops, uh, making connections for people. Uh, just how have you done that? Kit, why don't we start with you? Uh, well, we, uh, as I said, we've been doing this uh, for a long time to book with bookstores and we were new to comic bookstores. And um, luckily, Phil and his group reached out to us and said, we want to raise we want to raise money to help comic book stores. And uh, we, you know, naively said, sure, thinking, you know, that, you know, a couple thousand dollars later, we, there'd be some money we could give. Uh, we had kind of no idea that uh, you folks in the comic book world really take this seriously. And, you know, $430,000 later, uh, yeah, 
it's <laughs> it was it was insane um and it was it was amazing to us because not only did you raise that much money but you also at the same time made the comic book world aware that we were here for them and we couldn't have done that on our own because we didn't we don't know your industry that well yet um so it was huge that um folks in your industry reached out to each other and said no these guys are the real deal they have money to give you there are no strings attached it's you know it's legit um so it's not i mean not only just giving us the money that we could distribute to help the the stores um but giving that awareness which is is it takes years to get that and it was it was crammed into to 13 weeks <laughs> that is pretty amazing it's um, surprising to me how much things that as kit as you said usually take years have been just sped up in just a matter of days and weeks to get things going and then phil what did your you and your crew what sparked the idea to reach out to the uh binc foundation i have to tell you uh i had nothing to do with it um, um sam humphreys um and kemi garcia gracia oh shoot um reached out to me sam was like dude we're doing this thing do you want to do it uh and explained it to me briefly that it was actually modeled after um a fundraiser in australia our version of it um that was there to raise money after the devastating fires uh, that ravaged Australia last year. And it was a, a very simple method of uh, putting things up for auction, running auctions on Twitter, um, or I think a few people ran auctions on other platforms, um, timed auctions, taking highest bidder, making sure that money never saw our hands, but that went right to, um, right to the foundation. And uh, all we had to do was show up. Right. And so I, I think it's actually very, very important for people now. I did very little of the initial organizing. I they wanted an artist. They knew me. I said, well, of course. Um, but uh, yeah, I just want to really know that there was that there was a small group of authors, actually, which I think is actually really important, who said, let's do this. And then basically I hitched a ride on their caravan um, and we did everything that we could. But I, uh, and again, I, I, we raised an enormous chunk of money in a, in a short period of time. So what I appreciate about them, quite frankly, the book part of it was they were authors looking to save and looking to salvage in whatever way they could their own industry. And independent bookstores particularly are a great love for all of us. So even though the focus of course was on comic books, we're all readers and we love those spaces and we love bookstores. And so it seemed like an easy no-brainer. Um, and then, of course, when Jim Lee, the, the um, gosh, current publisher of DC Comics, hopped on and did these 60 drawings over 60 days, it was, uh, which were probably some of the best work he's done in 20 years, it was clear that he was passionate about the cause and the mission um, and that these, these bookstores and this nonprofit work mattered. And it was, it was very, very extraordinary. Uh, to see. So again, I, I hitched a ride. They asked me, I said yes. Um, and that's all the credit that I can take. But I think it's very important that you said yes, because and you, as you said, you showed up. That makes it amazing and helped grease the wheels to a lot of the coming together and just caring for people that we have seen in, across the board in the last few weeks has been very nice to see. And then jumping over to Alonzo, um, what has your nonprofit done with the COVID? So, you know, uh, when, you know, it feels like five years ago now, March, right? Uh, when uh, Shelter in Place started, you know, we went through this uh, kind of initial period of not knowing how we were going to make it through, right? Uh, are we going to have any attendance? Uh, uh, is the foundation money still going to be there, right? And uh, kind of going off the adage, you know, put your own oxygen mask on first, right? We kind of righted our ship, made sure I could, you know, meet payroll. Um, and then, you know, there was this initial kind of like, almost like existential 
moment where I was like, well, what do we do? You know, clearly like it's, it's within our mandate, we have resources, but this is so big, right? It's, it's not just local, it's statewide, it's not just statewide, it's national, how do we help? Uh, and I realized the, the best way that we could affect change was local, um, doing what we do. And the way I looked at it was, all of a sudden we actually had windows of time that had opened. Uh, San Diego itself, right, uh, as a county is as large as Connecticut on the East Coast. And all of a sudden I had all these chunks of travel time that no longer uh, mattered. So I reached out to, to schools that we partner, partnered with, uh, after school programs that I knew were hurting for art instruction uh, at this point. And uh, anytime that I saw a hole that had been taken up by travel, right, and this is just a small thing, but it helped me kind of find my feet for how to approach this. I just reached out to people and was like, hey, I've got an hour, do you want art instruction, right? I've got an instructor, we can do an after school program. And um, so we, we ballooned out a lot of what we've been uh, doing, which is kind of uh, ramping down now as the school years have ended for local schools. Uh, but it was really, it felt really nice to be able to bring comic instruction to schools um, at a time when it seemed like they really, uh, really needed it. The other thing uh, that really struck me was, uh, you know, a lot of times we talk about kind of uh, socioeconomic uh, disadvantages um, for neighborhoods, for regions, um, but with the various tribal groups uh, here in San Diego, uh, Barona, Kumeyaay, uh, I had reached out that there's kind of a, um, kind of a uh, geographic uh, economic uh, impediment, right? A lot of these reservations are far out, right? Um, and with Zoom, I was able to kickstart a lot of stuff we had started talking about with the Kumeyaay, with the Barona, um, because all of a sudden travel time is no longer an impediment, right? They don't have to worry about maybe getting down here. I don't have to have to find time to get up there. Um, and so we've been doing some amazing work with them where we're starting to adapt uh, these really cool creation myths that not only have never been drawn before, but they've never been, uh, you know, a lot of these tribes are very oral traditions. So they've never even been written down before. Um, and so it's been a really kind of uh, fun um, kind of kick in the pants for, uh, for the comics community here in San Diego. That is really, really cool to hear. I cannot wait to read some of those works. That's, and then, uh, Joe, how about yourself? Uh, so uh, like so I kind of mentioned earlier, I mean, we just kind of got off the board basically when COVID started. Um, and so part of it would it fell into our laps of, we have to make sure that we're just not a, a COVID nonprofit, basically that, you know, we're just a flash in the pan kind of thing. So a lot of it has been um, laying our groundwork of making sure that we set ourselves up um, and designate ourselves as specifically, we're here for the long haul. We want to be um, a resource for everybody for, for the extended period. Um, so we, we got the advantage of actually establishing our base here. Um, so we, we've been able to um, find new creators um, that we just put feelers out to, to anybody that we can talk to, um, essentially. And kind of the, I guess in one way, the fun part right now is um, I do daily search through Twitter, through Instagram, um, looking for artists of, you know, people that just, you know, I, I stumble on kids that have, you know, 80 followers on, on Twitter. And I'm like, you have legit talent. Um, I would love to be your somebody to echo for you. So please just, if you have any socials and any works that you want to put on our website, I will gladly put them up there, shine you, tweet you, and, you know, give you all the attention that, that the world can see. Um, because that's, that's one of the founding things that we wanted. We wanted to get people the opportunity to be heard from somebody else. And sometimes, you know, when you only have 10, 20 followers, it's hard to be heard. Um, it's hard to be found in this world. And so we're doing our best to just echo as many voices as we can. Um, and then what we do is um, currently what we, we have a couple of different uh, galleries on our, our website. Um, uh, one of them is Spotlight Gallery, which the Spotlight Gallery, we just kind of say, here are our new voices. These are people that you probably never heard of before. 
um, check out some of their works and, you know, we'll, we'll link their socials on all of it. Um, but then the other one is monthly, we select a limelight uh, creator. And this one is one that um, somebody that we know is very responsive, um, very, a very responsible person um, that, that is actually truly looking for some sort of professionalism and really wants to, to capitalize of what they have. Um, they work back and forth with us consistently. They, they talk with us, they keep interest back and forth. And so we want to make sure that we emphasize them as much as possible. So we give them a month spotlight of where we actually, you know, put up a full gallery for them just on their own. We do a one-on-one -on -one interview that we put out on YouTube. So that way they can kind of share their story a little bit. We find out a little bit more of who this actual person is. Um, and then we also send them out on all our news, news releases that we'll put out, you know, so that way we're showing the world, everybody that we talk to, this person has it and we want you to know they have it. Um, and so that way we can kind of give that little extra step. So we've been mainly working uh, with, with brand new talent, um, trying to get them noticed right now. And then the other projects that we were lucky enough is we've actually um, been talking to a couple of different people in regards to literacy programs that we could potentially use talent for. Um, and so, um, we're hammering out some details right now and a lot can't be spoken for at the moment, but we are working on a couple of different uh, things that we can actually end up doing, you know, literacy initiatives to actually work and get these, these kids, some of our creators into actual published materials that can actually go for actual learning materials for different schools. And so basically it's, it's making their own kind of, their own portfolio, essentially, their own piece that they can put in their cap and show to everybody across the board and said, look, I did this. Um, <laughs> and I think they would be truly proud of that. Um, one of the pieces that we're working on right now actually kind of fell in line with the fact that we have the Black Lives Matter movement going. We have Pride Month right now. Um, and so what we've capitalized and actually done is we're creating an ebook. Um, which will feature all of our talent uh, along with some established names. Uh, we have a uh, Cena Grace uh, is, is going to contribute a piece. I, I know that we have Ezra Clayton Daniels has contributed a piece as well. Um, and, and we're going to have them established names put with unknown names because we want them to, to say, Hey, look, they can be on the same page. You know, they're, they're relevant enough. And this ebook, 50% of our proceeds are going to a local African American charity in San Diego. The other 50% are going to an LGBTQ charity in San Diego because we found it important to actually be able to support the community that we're in as well. And, and especially with all these issues going on, we wanted to be you know sensitive to everybody's story. So that's that's basically what we're doing at the current time right now. And that kind of leads me into another one of my thoughts and questions that um, each of you have actually touched on. Uh, what are some of the new learning opportunities or collaborations that have surprised you in the last 13 weeks? Be it digital or people you never knew existed, like... <laughs> being I learned how to Zoom. That was a big thing. <laughs> yeah, just tell me about some of the new learning opportunities or collaborations that have surprised you and it can be anything you want well, I guess well, I um, you know one of the things that uh, just for us is um, uh, you know you spend so much time doing uh, little things that show up you know 15 20 minutes you know stopping to get a cup of coffee stopping into a comic store when maybe you don't need to but you know um, I, it's a, it's a write-off, so I'm going to do it anyways. Um, and I realized that my students were now almost kind of calling our bluff in terms of giving them stuff to do, stuff to go after. Uh, one of the things that we, I don't know that we would have really followed through on the way we did, um, was entering uh, five students' works uh, into the International Graphic Shakespeare Competition, uh, which comes out of South Korea. Um, and five of our students finished uh, comic books ranging in length from four to eight pages. Um, 
which, and honestly, I don't know that I would have had the focus um, to kind of uh, edit, you know, all this work uh, were it not for, uh, for COVID. And I don't know that I would have, it would have jumped out, you know, it wouldn't have been a, a flashy object the way uh, something immediate and local is that maybe isn't as beneficial for the students, but is here, right? But um, with, with the digital world we're, we're in right now, it kind of flattens uh, the world and you can kind of see across the horizon and uh, see more opportunities, right? All of a sudden, South Korea is one Zoom meeting away. <laughs> um, and so in that way, I, I've been surprised by how much I've enjoyed uh, using Zoom at times. <laughs> Uh, I, I had my first um, class with Shanghai uh, a couple of weeks ago through a connection with SVA. Uh, and it was very funny because it was eight my time, like 11 p.m. Their time. The, the, the time change was very, very funny. Um, but I enjoyed it more than I expected. Uh, one of the things, so I teach at School of Visual Arts, which is uh, where I met Alonzo. And we, like so many schools, had to finish um, our semester online, and so it, it demanded very quickly a complete reevaluation of curriculum and, uh, and how we teach curriculum. And I teach life drawing, uh, and so teaching that through this format became a, a very interesting challenge, and one that I was grateful for because it completely forced me to reevaluate re the way I teach, um, how I interact with uh, students, what I'm teaching, um, and also I would say the I, I guess the, the currency of what I'm teaching, like the, its value. And so one of the things I really, really appreciate about this format, um, and I feel like I adapted to it, some, some of my peers adapted to it much more quickly than others, um, was that forced reevaluation um, and, and the problems. And so I've often said that any sort of storytelling is problem solving. Um, that's all we're doing is problem solving. And so this is, this forces all sorts of problem solving in a really wonderful way to me. Um, it also, quite frankly, expands kind of like what Alonso was saying, um, the possibilities of reach. So I can take classes and people can take my classes literally across the globe um, as long as we can all meet some, you know, here at, at roughly the same time. Um, and so I've actually really enjoyed this format and what it has demanded of me and its reach. And um, I've been far less resistant to it than some people who I know are like kind of sick of their Zoom meetings. Kit, go uh, ahead. Uh, we have, um, we didn't have new things so much as we just sort of turbocharged what we had. Um, uh, a normal year for, a normal super busy year for us would be, oh, you, we'd help 300 families, um, not, not 500 families in 13 weeks and 1600 stores. So it, you know, we found the value of volunteers uh, that can do things remotely. Um, and any number of groups out there uh, helping us, I mean, everybody just chipping in to help. Uh, we certainly could not have done this. We're, we're a really small organization. We only have four people. So um, there's no way we could have done it. Uh, the, there was one day when literally um, the requests were coming in every 15 minutes. And we were at that point um, just crying. We, we, we had no idea how we were going to deal with this. But, um, you know, it's people, people hear about it. People jump in. Um, through Zoom, through the miracles of technology, you can set them up in their living rooms and, and they caught us up and they, they got the money distributed. And uh, it, was, it was just amazing to, um, to, to be able to scale up like that. We, if you'd told us a year ago, we would have we said, you're crazy. But, you know, if you have to do it, you do it. It works. Yeah, I guess on our end too, uh, we kind of, you know, we never had an established office space in the first place. And now I've realized I may never need an office place again, <laughs> again. Um, because I mean, we do so much um, in, in just, you know, I, I think I answered about 15 emails in, in bed the other morning, just because, you know, it's like, well, 
shoot, I'm here. I got my phone. I can do it. Um, and, and I mean, it's, it's that simple at this point that technology has really been a blessing. Um, so that way we can get, you know, more work done before 8 a.m. than, you know, I used to have to, you know, commute an hour each way. And in which time it'd be like, boy, that's, that's two hours just right down the pipe that, you know, you never get to do. You don't get to be with your family. You don't get to, you know, have time with friends or anything like that. And, you know, that's just kiss goodbye. And I mean, sure, I listen to a lot of podcasts during that time frame, and I'm going to miss that. But <laughs> outside of that, though, I mean, the time that I've had, you know, being able to just answer and do all my work, you know, I, I can do literally half my work for the, the day before, you know, I even have breakfast. And so I think um, Zoom's gone a long way in helping with that. So that way we can have conversations, I think. Um, being able to to do everything remotely has been a blessing, although um, in in a house with kids and you know other people, you know, I mean, my Wi-Fi sucks about half the time, and it's just because everybody's on it at the same time. <laughs> so that may be my biggest struggle that I'm running across right now. But uh, besides that, you know, I've 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 found working from home, you know, a nice change of pace as uh, the regular nine to five that we used to have to do. Although it's making me a little weird because I don't see people as often. So uh, I'm, I may have to work on that aspect of socializing all over again. So that's kind of brings me to a, you're just as if you know all my questions, you're answering them, which is good. <laughs> Uh, there's been like COVID-19 has really impacted the world around us and has kind of led to this shared global support and what I like to call a creative renaissance. It's brought us back to relearning technology or getting us up to speed on things we didn't think like we'd be doing a year or two ago. And it's just kind of brought a new learning opportunities. What are some of the inspirational and creative ideas that you've seen come out of the last 13, 14, 15 weeks, just in some of the work you've done or something that you didn't think you'd be doing, but wow, well, here it is. And something you would think is going to maybe stick around after COVID-19, hopefully it gets cured or at least, um, by, you know, vaccine or something in a little while, but what do you think is going to, I know there's a lot in there, but answer how you will. I mean, I guess uh, for me uh, here at Little Fish, I, I, I think I'd long kind of uh, dismissed, not even underestimated, dismissed the kind of efficacy of online instruction for art um, in any kind of meaningful way. Um, but um, in particular, one one kind of example of this is we have a partnership with uh, Arts, which is a acronym. Uh, it's a reason to survive. Uh, they're an art nonprofit in National City. And we had started um, this kind of concept of uh, the students kind of writing stories about themselves, their lives, um, and then assembling it into a, uh, a zine or kind of a very DIY black and white comic uh, at the end of the semester, roughly. Uh, and then COVID hits and literally all that had to be scrapped, right? Because I had all that work, all the students are in their various homes. And when we started, again, theoretically moving towards a comic, I thought we weren't going to get anywhere. You know, I thought we'd have, you know, a couple scraps here and there. Um, you know, good job, uh, pat on the back, call it a day. Uh, but all the students uh, really kind of uh, came through. You know, um, it showed, um, you know, the kind of power of creativity, um, especially during a time like this, right, when, when, kids need some, some kind of tool, some kind of emotional tool to kind of work through uh, their anxiety, their depression, how they're feeling, just the chaos. Um, and so they, they put all this work together and then I, you know, I, I put my mask on, uh, I put surgical gloves on and went to all their houses uh, in my minivan over the course of a day and picked up their work. Uh, worked with a printer who uh, generously donated uh, his time and resources and uh, assembled it into a comic. Um, that, that they dubbed uh, Into the Coronaverse, um, which was uh, super fun. Uh, and I honestly, if you would ask me if we could have uh, started and finished a comic purely online, uh, I would have said absolutely not. So I think it'll, it has really opened my eyes to the possibility of 
wide ranging partnerships uh, in all kinds of different fields um, working online, which is uh, exciting. Uh, yeah, I guess to capitalize off of that, you know, part of what I found was amazing is that I, you know, I was using Twitter to find artists and, and talk to them and stuff and, and the reach is incredible. Um, you know, I've had contact with, um, I've, I've talked to people from one fellow from Nigeria. I've talked to somebody from Italy. I've talked to somebody from Belgium, from Germany and from Poland all during this. And they're all kind of in the same boat, you know, I mean, they're all facing the same thing. Um, and so, but you know, they're just sitting there at their homes and they want to be, they still want to do it. They still want to be creative. Um, but you know, they're just sitting there just kind of twiddling their thumbs stuck in four walls, just like you are. Um, and so it, it's, it's kind of funny how, you know, it's being able to reach out and, and talk to somebody that's across on the other side of the world. Um, and actually have a conversation with them and actually kind of like get their perspective on things really kind of opens your own personal eyes uh, and kind of lets you kind of, you know, realize you know, sometimes I don't have it so bad that, you know, I kind of think about, but, um, but the fact that I can, you know, give a helping hand to these people that are so far away, it, it's really just mind blowing. You know, you'd never think about that because, you know, usually you're only talking to the people that are in your, basic county or whatever have you and so now all of a sudden i'm talking to people i'd never dreamed of i actually speak to so that's kind of one of the fun fun aspects of this we've been, we've been um amazed surprised uh thankful for just all the different amazing ways that people have figured out how to raise money to do good um, you know, before the fundraisers were all sort of the same, you know, you, you had a, an event somewhere and, and people would donate or join or whatever, but the fact that they can't go be together, uh, physically has, uh, just brought out an amazing amount of creativity from, you know, all the drawings that, uh, the comic folks have done to, um, authors. Uh, having live events to, you know, somebody designed socks with a book theme and sold them. It's just every day these, these ideas come in that it's, it, we're just constantly amazed by the creativity of everybody. It's, it's been fabulous. Um, I'm sounding a little bit like Debbie Downer, but I was just thinking about one of the interesting things about being in New York is that this has happened is and they, they, there have been op-ed pieces and things about this um and certainly memes on twitter it was a reminder that this isn't a vacation that we don't suddenly just get three months off right that that we're in the middle of a sort of a global pandemic we have friends whose parents have died etc so it was like the seriousness of it uh has weighed on me for a long time and part of what that means is that i mean i'm a fairly serious half glass empty kind of person anyway, but it was a it was a reminder that to take advantage of this time, not because it was like, oh, free time, I can finally learn how to cook or sew, but in many ways, um, I, I, I feel like I'm going off track, but just, it was, it was impossible, I, I felt like to do anything without remembering why we were doing it in the first place, like why we had access to this time at all, right? Um, and so, and so for me, I feel like everything I've done is in somehow remembrance of, of trying to remember that, right? Like, uh, I started a writing group, donated art, um, I've donated a ton of money. One of the things I have done, which is very interesting, is thinking about my normal New York life when it came to a halt, it meant I simply had lots of money. And I don't mean millionaire money, but I had an enormous amount of disposable income that I would waste in any given month that I could suddenly donate to um, organizations that I never had, that I would do occasionally or once every three months. Um, like I, I think I had one recurring donation, and now uh, that's it. Feels like that's all I'm doing, and I'm really happy to do it. And I'm doing it because people need it, right? So for me, the, what's interesting about this time is it is a constant reminder of need beyond opportunity to express creatively 
it has become for me an opportunity to, I would say, give more than I had in before um, in ways that I hadn't even considered before. And so that, for that alone, I'm really, really grateful. Um, and so, um, no, and honestly, that's very important to remember because, yes, it's been good that we've had this time, but there are serious consequences to what is happening, and we cannot forget that. And like you said, we can create things, we can do things to honor that and realize we have to be more than these simple little pockets. We've really got to be kind. We've got to look out for each other because who else is going to do that? We have a unique opportunity here to, I don't know, I, this might say naive of me, but I think we have a real opportunity here to make a true difference with everything that has been happening and just actually acknowledging and realizing there's a lot of messed up stuff going on. Let's take a good hard look at it and how we can fix it and at least listen. Just, it's, I have a lot of hope, I hope. Now, it is certainly, I was just going to say, if I can just end, it has certainly given me sure. Uh, clarity and motivation for the future on where and how to channel um, both money but energy, right? Like it's so, it's amazing the clarity the past three months have, have brought. And, and if nothing else, I'm grateful for that. Yes, I totally agree with you. So <laughs> um, this, we're getting towards the end. I have a couple more questions uh, that I would like to get to. Um, now, how as we've got a wide spread of people here as we've had nonprofits, comics creators, comic shops, fans, people in general, how could they thrive in this current world? If you had one piece of advice to impact to people, what would that be? Um, I... Um you know, I've started adapting a what's usually a negative psychological term, um, but that's me. Uh, so I'm going to repackage stuff as I need to. Um, you know, so I've, I've adapted kind of very consciously and deliberately at this point, a kind of cognitive dissonance where um, I'll kind of hold two things simultaneously. I'm both thinking kind of negatively, like this is never going to end. This is the new now forever and ever what are you going to do and then also um okay uh what are we bringing back with us uh when this is all over right what are we getting back to right and i i i realize i juggle those two kind of contradictory things kind of simultaneously um and i don't know if it's good um uh <laughs> psychological advice uh, maybe make sure you've got a good therapist first uh but for businesses, for uh, creatives, to kind of always be ready to adapt uh, if need be. Uh, and that sounds a little wartime mentality, but it's kind of a, a crazy time. Um, and I was talking to a local retailer and he has done a great job adapting. You know, he's now kind of limited opening, but uh, he had uh, pivoted heavily and had basically overhauled his eBay page and made it a full comic store online, right? And I talked to him and he was like, I don't want to do this. You know, I love the community of having a comic store. That's what I want to do. Hopefully I can do that. But until then I'm living in this world, right? And I have to honor that and kind of go with that, right? So, um, you know, balance those two things um, and always be ready to pivot. <laughs> if I can bounce off that, um... One of the things that I have been trying very, very hard to do with my students in recent years, but certainly the past few months, is um, to make them to make them more aware. And what what I mean by that is, uh, I find cartoonists particularly can be highly myopic, right? Like highly focused. So that can be great for generating. But in terms of planning for the future, I think it's helpful to be aware of not only what is happening in your business and our business say, not only what's happening in, in book and comic book stores and distribution, but what is happening in business, what is happening in entertainment, what is happening in medicine. I think trying to encourage a larger global perspective um, without being overwhelmed, of course, there's an enormous amount of information. I don't mean to sort of, I don't mean to bathe in it, 
but just to sort of track trends, right? Like, um, because ultimately we are, I mean, at least in my neck of the woods, I'm training young artists to create works that they want people to buy. And so I like them to know, like, what's the, how is the market shaping? Who's buying that? Like, what regions can you sell in? What new bookstores? What online opportunities? Uh, and the thing I'm always flummoxed by is how, uh, if my students are thinking this way, they're not very good at expressing it, but I truly don't think they're thinking as globally as they can. And if there's anything that this time reminds me of, it's like, uh, I think the best thing you can do to prepare for the future is just be aware, right? Um, what's happening here, what's happening, what's happening here? Uh, because who knows where those opportunities will occur. And one final note, certainly in our business, we've been talking about um, that artists now work in many, many fields, uh, rarely one anymore. So they'll work in advertising, they'll work, work in film and TV, they'll, they will work in comics or graphic design. And so, uh, or video game design. So there's a lot of tracking that you have to do and a lot of things that affect those businesses as well. So if I can just encourage them to start getting out of their myopic holes and just being aware a little bit more of what's happening in the world and tracking trends, um, I think it not only makes them better artists, but I think it sets them up in a way for the future that they might not have been before. And after they've got, after they've gotten the big picture, they can remember that they have this wonderful community that's around them, um, that's there to support them. And, and you know, you can, um, whether it's, whether it's the community of artists or, or writers, or it's the community around your store that's supporting you. Um, it's there are always people out there, and you need to you need to reach out and and use that community and give that community a reason to to help you. They're they're that's what they want to do, and uh, and if you give them give people a chance, they will they will rise higher than you can imagine. Absolutely. Actually, tagging off of what Kit said was, um, you know, one of the things that I kind of try to make sure I do when I email and, and talk to different people is I just give them a couple of quick words of encouragement and just say, you know, look, you, you're talented, you got it, you know, you can do stuff. Um, well, you know, the sun always comes up tomorrow kind of thing, you know, sunshine rainbows. Um, because honestly, right now, a lot of stuff that people tend to face right now, it is, it's a bit cloudy out, you know, uh, and you know, some people have gone through some serious stuff through this time. Um, you know, I mean, it, they may have not even, you know, had COVID strike them directly, but you know, I mean, it could affect their housing. It could affect, you know, their income. It could affect so many different things. So, you know, I mean, everybody's world could be really dark right now. So, um, just reaching out with a few kind words, uh, every once in a while goes so far. Um, it, it really can help people a lot with, um, with what they're dealing with. Um, so I always, I always try to tell people, you know, just give those quick words of encouragement to the people around you in your community, lift them up, you know, they'll do the same. They'll lift you up too. Uh, and, and that's, that's how you can make those strong bonds. All right. And I am going to lead us into our last question here. Something for a little bit of fun of, to end the panel on. Uh, what is one of your favorite comics or books that you are currently reading? Doesn't have to be a current one, it can be an old one, new one, something you recently discovered. I always like to talk with uh, my panelists like what they're reading because I like to always, I'm a librarian, I love reader's advisory, so I'm using you to do that for me for those that are gonna be watching this. Uh, I have three things I can show you because uh, I never read one thing at a time. Um, I've been, uh, I started House, the, the sort of classic House on Mango Street a long time ago and never finished it, so I returned to it. Um, this might be a little bit heavy, but fascinating, The Sixth Extinction, particularly the chapter on dying frogs. And I have been, re I've been going through Ronin recently, uh, an old Frank Miller work from late 80s in DC Comics. Oh my gosh, this still has Warner books on it. All you book nerds, um, which shows how old my copy is, uh, because it's actually a really um, extraordinary uh, chart of sort of an artist evolving in a work. 
the work he, the way that story ends uh, visually is not the way it begins. And it's, it's really extraordinary to see. And um, it, is, it is wonderful to be reminded of how groundbreaking something like a comic book uh, can be artistically. Um, so let's see, I have been reading, I just finished uh, George Takei's uh, graphic memoir, uh, They Called Us Enemy, uh, about Japanese internment. Uh, fantastic book. Um, just really powerful, uh, really, really um, amazing work. Um, also, uh, I just uh, have been reading uh, Jean Yang's uh, Superman Smashes the Clan, uh, which is a fantastic graphic novel adaptation of a 1950s radio serial. Uh, highly recommended, really good. Uh, and then uh, there's a uh, cartoonist, he's actually worked with Gene in the past, uh, uh, Teen Fam. Um, and Teen has been doing these um, one to three panel quarantine comics, he calls them, on his Facebook page. And I realize at the end of the day, it's one of the things that I really look forward to. Like, what did Teen do today? Right? Like, how is he processing the quarantine? It makes me wish I had done that from the very beginning, because there's so much, you know, just as humans that we're going to forget that happened, right? Uh, we're in kind of a dream slash nightmare, uh, and I think we're going to have to, like, pack a lot away. Um, but I'll, I'll consult teens' uh, comics when I need to, um, you know, check in emotionally with how it went. Um, I guess... Uh... Right now, uh, I don't read too much heavy stuff only because I guess the world's too heavy for me right now. So, so I've been keeping it with lighter fare. Um, but uh, something is killing the children, uh, which I guess you can call lighter fare maybe, um, is actually uh, is fantastic to read right now. Um, it, it's definitely the horror genre that you know will will just melt your brain. Um, and, and the artwork is just next level. Um, and then uh, the other thing I'm reading is, uh, because I'm, a, I'm just a giant D&D &D nerd, um, I, uh, I've been reading the, uh, the Critical Role, um, Legends of Vox Machina, um, volumes one and two. Um, and they have, the, the Critical Role program is one of my favorite programs period. Um, so I, I consistently watch that over and over again. Um, and, and so to see a graphic novel adaptation has just been pure joy for me, just because I just fall away into it and disappear into my fantasy land. And I've, uh, I just finished a book that actually it was a, it was an advanced copy. So I'm not even sure it's out, but it's called broke and it's about, um, life in inner city Detroit and it's really eye-opening um, as far as what's going on right now. Um, and I, I also, um, I always have at least a couple books and a couple audio books going at the same time and I've, I just finished listening to Robert Reich, The, um, the Common Good, which um, it's about the third time I've listened to it and every time I get down I just sort of have to bring that back up and, and listen to it again. Because there is hope. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And I think that's going to do it for us. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. I hope you laughed, you cried, you laughed a lot more, cried a little bit more, and hopefully learned a lot. Thank you all for joining us, and see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.